Welcome to Calumet Roundtable, the student-produced interview show um, from Purdue Calumet. I'm your host, Lee Arts, from the Department of Communication. I'm joined today by my guest, Dr. David Green, um, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Anatomy at um, Midwestern University in Downers Grove, Illinois. He had his PhD in uh, hominid paleobiology from George Washington University and his bachelor's in biological anthropology and anatomy from Duke. So welcome, Dr. Green. Thank you very I'm much. glad you could join us. We have, uh, for the first time, I think, in Calumet <laughs> Roundtable history, we have um, specimens to show. Um, the, the subject of today's uh, talk is the discovery um, in South Africa, I believe it was 30 miles or so from Johannesburg, mm -hmm. where a new species was discovered. And Dr. Green was one of the people on that team. So we're delighted to have you here, and we want to talk about this a little bit. Maybe you could give us a background of this was May 2014. And what, what, what exactly is the excitement about this in the world of uh, archaeology or paleobiology? Sure. Well, it, I think uh, being early November, this is actually almost the two-year anniversary of the first excavation. So the initial call to dig the site was in late 2013. And then after the initial discovery and, and uh, recovery of all the, the fossils, there was a call in early 2014 for research of, of all different areas of expertise to come to Johannesburg for a 30-day workshop to examine the fossils, basically um, brainstorm. So and, you, did, you weren't you know, involved in the digging of the fossils? I wasn't they, involved in the they excavation. They were already out on a table and you were asked to? Well, they were in boxes wrapped up in <laughs> toilet paper and other various okay. apparatuses. And um, I, I, wasn't, I didn't meet the criteria to get into the cave. Okay. I'm, I'm pretty small, but I'm not slender enough, I guess you could say. Um, although the, the call to, to bring in the excavators was out on Facebook and I, I didn't see it. So I, even if I were to fit the criteria, I missed that opportunity. But I did, I did have a friend who was one of the six excavators. Okay. And so I followed her updates and also followed the National Geographic was doing a live blog. And it was really exciting. And then when, when the, the head of the, the, the team, Lee Berger, who's a, he's actually an American, but he's a professor at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. Um, I should have mentioned the university that was leading the team. That's fine. Yeah. Wit Wits University. And mm -hmm. Yeah, it's okay. easier to go by Wits, Wits. yeah. Okay. <laughs> and so he got his PhD there in the mid-90s, and he stayed on as a postdoctoral researcher, and now as a, a full professor, research professor. And he put out the call for uh, researchers to, to come in and basically try to make heads and tails literally, figuratively, yeah. of what was found. And so he, he, he targeted what you call junior researchers. So, so, so folks that are maybe in their later stages of their graduate degree, so they've been compiling a dissertation data set, or they've recently defended their dissertation, they're out on, they're doing a postdoc, or in my case, I was a, you know, an early um, all these faculty people, member. All these people were dealing with um Human-related species. Yes, I mean, is that that mm -hmm. was what the call was? Okay. Yeah, most of the people that they were targeting had done work with with fossil hominins, but also there were people that that do a lot of work with um, modern human population variation, uh, looking at the variation among populations of individuals that live in different types of climates. You know, very cold adapted, warm adapted, that I'm sort gonna, of thing. I, I've got a question on that in a little bit, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I want to get one thing uh, before we start on the science and, uh, and we'll talk about the specimens that you've brought. One mm -hmm. of the media um, excitement about this was it was an opportunity. There was a significant number of women that were uh, participated in the actual excavation. Mm -hmm. I think there's a photo that, that shows that here's the cave entrance and it's tiny little, I think it was 10 inches. Something they said like at that. one place where you could get through and then there was a big opening and then it also goes down to 10 inches. And I don't know how yeah. anybody would put their dead there. but uh, <laughs> So most of the archaeologists or the, the d excavators that came were women. Um, it, and there was a big debate, obviously, on social media and the rest that the mm -hmm. only time women got to go is that they were small enough to get through the hole in the ground. Or could, can you just give us some background on sure. what was a media splash about this? Well, I think the initial announcement, I mean, one of the things that was said in the initial announcement was, you know, those who are claustrophobic need not apply because okay. it, it's it, just even thinking about 
you know, going under there and, yeah. not, you know, I think they had structural engineers making sure everything was okay, but you're kind of, they knew that it was a very risky endeavor. How, how, how would they know that when you're crawling in a 10 inch hole that there's mm -hmm. something at the other end? I mean, how did you even get to this? <laughs> so, at, I mean, how would you know that there might be something there? Why would somebody keep going? That's a good, that's an <laughs> excellent question. And the, so Lee is a very enterprising individual and, um, Five years ago, in 2010, he made a really impressive discovery at a nearby site called Malapa, and they found two nearly complete skeletons that have been um, designated also as a new species called Australopithecus sediba. And so following that, this is a cave that was very close to another cave called Gladys Vale that he, Lee has worked at previously, but it had basically gone unnoticed. So from that point on, and I think part of the way that he discovered that cave was, was something very novel and accessible to most people was Google Maps, Google Earth. He was looking because these, these limestone caves are all over this area of South Africa and most of the discoveries that were made by biologists and paleoanthropologists in the 20th century and beyond were basically by accident because limestone workers had gone in, blasted these caves okay. out with dynamite and the, the deposits are kind of a conglomerate of limestone and part of the geologists may, you know, call me on my word. So <laughs> I hope they'll no give me a break on that. Okay, so I hope they'll <laughs> give me a break on that. But basically these come out as blocks of breccia, which is a very dense and difficult to work um, limestone deposit. In fact, once you find a bone in these breccia deposits, you have to chisel it out with, a, with a, an air uh, needle, kind of, it's a vibrating okay. and it takes a long, long time. Or they have to use acid to kind of release the the stone the from the bone, die, but the, exactly, yes. okay. yeah. And so he and his, his at the time, nine-year-old son found some bones in these deposits. And so I think he kind of, after that success, said, you know, there's a lot of cave systems that we haven't, you know, found in, in this area. And we know that this area has, there, there's been, in addition to Australopithecus sediba, there's been several other fossil species, hominin species that have been found in, in this area of South Africa. Um, Australopithecus africanus is one of the most is one of the oldest discovered, one of the more famous. Um, a species of Paranthropus is also known from there, which is kind of a side branch of the of the human lineage, and even other members of the genus Homo, Homo erectus, and potentially Homo habilis have also been discovered in some of these caves. So we know there's stuff out there to find, and so you know Lee has friends all over the place, and he had a friend um, who's kind of an amateur caver, and he basically said, you know, if you ever or out, just explore. <laughs> and I, I think the, the National Geographic special, the Nova special that came out, you know, he even uh, bought him a, a motorcycle to go off and kind of explore these areas. And this guy had other friends that were amateur cavers. Is the National Geographic paying for all this? I mean, they're fun, because they were one of the three, mm -hmm. uh, Wits University, the, yes. the South Africa mm -hmm. Department of Science, and then the National Ge Geographic. So they're, they're funding the motorcycles and the cavers and the... I don't, I don't think they funded that, but they did fund once the initial discovery was made where... So I'll, I'll get, I guess I'll get to that. The, yeah. the, there are two guys, um, two men, very skinny, very tall, that were exploring this, this cave called the Dinaletti Cave. Okay. And it was fairly well known, I guess, among South African cavers. And they were just kind of looking around, and apparently the story goes that one of the the cavers wanted to get by the other guy because they were in a tight quarter, and so the guy stepped back and kind of noticed that there was nothing behind him, and he knew there was an open chamber. So these guys just kind of being so they fell onto this, they fell to this by accident, and then they find these yeah. fossils. They took and some. Then it becomes mm -hmm. a a major dig. They took some pictures okay. and they brought them back to. The motorcycle guy, who, uh, for my, the name is escaping me, and he That's brought right. them to Lee. Apparently, you know, beat down the his new door late at night. We'll call him motorcycle guy. Right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and um, yeah, so once once Lee saw that, and he knew that there was, had been other people in there because they could tell that the bones had been kind of then he disturbed. puts out this call. Then and he then puts he out gets the call. All these women that show up. Yeah, and I guess there were. I think of their top 10 of the short list of people that they thought were most qualified because you had to have some experience in excavating bones. You had to be available pretty much at a, the drop of a hat because they wanted to do it quickly. So that, that probably meant that it had to be graduate students who yes. are a little bit more flexible with time. And yeah, given the, the unusual parameters and, and given the nature of our species, women tend to be 
more slender. Okay. But there was a, a male that I think was on the short list. And uh, at, I guess at the end of the at the end of the day, he didn't make the the final uh, whatever the, the the structural parameters were necessary. Okay. But you know, the, if you look at the picture that 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 uh, is featured in a lot of the the websites of the of the six cavers, they are they're not all like five foot. Now they're not basically gymnasts. Right. You have, you know, fairly short. You have also a, a very tall. Um, but they're all women. slender, so they can get through. Yeah, this and they all are bold enough to go and do it, yeah. and they they're passionate that about was what they do. Probably a big requirement. Mm -hmm. They'd be willing to actually crawl down. Yeah, in there. and okay. I think some of the media that came out recently was that it was meant to be kind of a publicity stunt, yes. and that really isn't a fair categorization of it. Well, the question was that National Geographic often does these things that are mm -hmm. scientific, but it's also popular science, so a lot of it has to be mm -hmm. the way that they draw the maps and the way they share the pictures and the, and the background mm -hmm. color, so that would raise the question. Yeah. But the discovery is a, uh, it's a, it's an amazing discovery. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I understand that the, that, it's, that the new species is called a Homo naledi, mm -hmm. is that correct? Mm -hmm. And it's based upon um, that it was at Denaledi, which was, is that the park or is that the That's the, the, the cave system. Okay, mm -hmm. which is part of a, a World Heritage Site yes. by the UN. So mm -hmm. anybody that digs there needs permission from the United Nations to do the dig. So National Geographic or um, Berger, Berger yeah. uh, got the permission and they put the uh, team together that did the dig and the UN gave permission to to do it in a restricted area, or just this cave in particular? Well, I, I don't, I don't know exactly how the permitting works. I don't know how, what office of the UN it goes through, but I know that Lee has several permits through the university to dig at these, um, these various sites. And I know he's worked at, like I said, the Gladys Vale is another cave, and Malapa is part of the same system. So the whole area has been has been designated a World Heritage Site because of what it is, um, what information it is gleaned about. Our natural history, and so so it's a it's, World Heritage Site because of the geography, not because of animals or tundra or something, but yeah. because of the actual uh, geography of the limestone and the caves. Is I'd that? say all of the above. There oh, are okay. there are protected okay. um, uh, landscapes. There are protected um, free ranging. Usually, there are actually a lot of private owners of these lands. Um, so I think it's done in. Um, in coordination with the private owners that okay. you know after the fact when when the importance of these sites and they didn't want people coming in and potentially denigrating them they designated them as protected sites uh, obviously I find this extremely interesting and I hope the viewers do too but too. we've only done the first half of the show okay. and we haven't got to the discussion I want okay. to ask you questions about what makes a species what's a scapula how you can tell it is. <laughs> but for right now we're gonna take a quick break uh, Calumet Roundtable will be right back in just a few minutes stay with us The crew of the Calumet Roundtable would like to thank the National Geographic Society for their support of the Homo Naledi research. The images used in this show are from the October 2015 issue of the National Geographic magazine. Welcome back to Calumet Roundtable, the student-produced interviewing show here at Purdue Calumet. My name is Lee Arts. Uh, today my guest is Dr. David Green, who is a uh, hominid paleobiologist. He teaches at uh, Midwestern University in Downers Grove, Illinois. Um, we did a lot of the introductory before, but I have questions that probably, uh, as a paleobiologist, you would want to talk for a lot longer than we have here. But one thing I'd like to know, and I'm sure the, the viewers would like to know, is how, how is a species defined? Um, earlier you listed three or four species mm -hmm. that uh, Dr. Berger had found in this, in this area of the World Heritage Site, mm -hmm. and now we have the Homo naledi, and it's a, it's a new species. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the criteria that's used to say that this is a new species as opposed to just a specimen that's different from the ones we've looked at before. Okay. Well, I guess I'll, I'll just correct the record. Dr. Berger found Australopithecus sediba. He didn't find those other two species, okay. but he has worked with them. So, okay. but I, uh, people 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 credit. will kill me if I, if I didn't <laughs> correct that. Okay. Um, so, a species, you know, at, at the very heart of it is a hypothesis, especially in the fossil record. And we found even in our even in you know modern biology, what we define as a species. So, you know, species A 
is, is this population of individuals, species B is this population of individuals, and they, they don't intermix, they don't interbreed. And we're finding that even that is problematic. You know, we find was that... Was that one of the criteria mm -hmm. for species, that there wasn't interbreeding? That would be a biological species concept. You know, okay. a species... But that's not true. <laughs> but that doesn't seem to work out. We okay. even have, you know, one example I like to point to is we have species of baboons that are even different genera. So we have uh, uh, Papio baboons and Therapithecus baboons. So they're a different genus altogether. And we've learned that there are zones where they hybridize. Okay. So what we as humans categorize a species as an imperfect thing. It's a hypothesis. In the fossil record, we look at traits of the bones that preserve. And that's always going to be an imperfect thing because we're biased by not everything that lives and dies will preserve in the fossil record. And even from that, only a very small percentage of whatever lived and died will be preserved. So we're going with a very biased and imperfect record to begin with. And then oftentimes we are just basing it on very minimal pieces of bones. Usually the most, what we call diagnostic uh, features of a skeleton are gonna be aspects of the cranium, aspects of the dentition. Um, those seem to be the things that we can compare across time and space and really determine if there's differences in the cusp morphology of the teeth or the, the, the brain capacity, which is one of the hallmarks of our lineage is, is the increase in, in brain Just size. The, the brain cavity size? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we have a slide here that the viewers can see which shows Great. a contemporary human uh, skull and then mm -hmm. the skull from Naledi. Yes. The thing that struck me is the only difference was the size of the brain cavity. But that's, that's not an insignificant thing and we're no, talking, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. but, but, but that kind of leads to a, maybe a silly second question. You find a fossil, mm -hmm. you say, here's another species. Mm -hmm. um, and we were talking on the break, what if we found a thousand years from now uh, somebody like Shaquille O'Neal's fossil or that man that lived to be eight feet tall in Alton, Illinois, and you dig this up and say, here's a new species, because look, his brain cavity is twice as big as anything we've seen before. How, how can you make that determination with only one, in this case, only one? Is it, was it only one fossil, or was it more than one? Well, the Letty is a, is a really rare example. Is it, was of, it one? Or? No, it's actually... Um, we think there's at least 15 individuals, oh, okay. Okay. but there's 1,500 bits and pieces of bone, but they're fragmentary, so 1,500 may not be 1,500 individual bones, and certainly not 1,500 individuals, because... But there were 15 spe specimens. 15 individuals, okay. yes, based on um, a dental characteristic that we have uh, repeated. So we have one tooth from one area, from one side, that's repeated at least 15 times. Okay. So we so know that we have... some inferences from Correct. That. I accept that. Okay. So... Um, <laughs> In the past, in, in our history, in paleoanthropology history, a lot of our species are built from maybe one fragment of a jaw. And that is unfortunate because... And is that defensible? I guess, right? I mean, if I, I, I teach communication, yes. somebody pro writes an essay for me and says, here's my argument and here's my example. And I usually yeah. say, well, one example is one example. Mm -hmm. From that, you can't make a general conclusion. Are you saying that in general, uh, uh, the discovery of fossils based on a very few specimens, but there's sufficient information from which you can say this isn't just a variation within one species, but it actually is another species? I think, I think that reaction is perfectly reasonable, particularly outside of the field. And I think even within the field, even though that's maybe sufficient for our purposes, we do know that it's very imperfect. And there are fields devoted to um, you know, I guess subfields that are devoted to testing that, you know, we can, you know, use statistics and say, what is the likelihood that we would pull this fragment of bone and not be able to find it within a, a range of variation of, of some population of yeah, maybe modern yeah. humans or some population of Homo erectus, which maybe we have a better fossil record for, or Australopithecus afarensis, which we have a pretty good fossil record for. And then if we can say, well, look, statistically, we wouldn't expect to find it within this within this range of variation of these fossils, unless we were willing to allow a range of variation that we don't know is existing in a modern species. So and the discovery is so far out of my, what might be yeah. a range and, within the species that yeah. at least at, a, mm -hmm. at the beginning, you can at least hypothesize that this may be yeah. a new species. And if we were to find Shaquille O'Neal, that would certainly gum things up. <laughs> the, 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 great thing about Naledi is that we have 15 individuals yes. and the range of variation is actually pretty minor. So what we're talking about is, is not only one species but maybe even one population. There might be multiple generations but geologically speaking that's, that's a blink. So 
we have really good evidence because we have multiple representations of multiple bones. So, you, you, so your role in this is mm -hmm. the cavers found the, the specimens, yeah. people went in and, and separated the specimens from the, the yeah. surrounding material. This is all laid out in boxes wrapped yeah. in tissue paper. Yeah, so uh, I did more of the clean you work. Did, you did, <laughs> you got to come and your specialty was the shoulder area Correct. of the bone and now you're gonna uh, measure the bone, check the density, check the size, and determine if it falls in the range of the other species that we've have been pr already determined as separate species. So exactly. when you look, uh, we have these uh, wonderful mm -hmm. uh, visual aids here. So <laughs> I, I just brought these it, as window dressing. Yeah, but, but this is part of the, this is part of the shoulder blade. So if yes. you were to look at a naledi, mm -hmm. a Homo naledi, and you compared it with a, a human. Um, shoulder blade yes. or scapula, what mm -hmm. would be the, some of the differences that, that you did find? So this is, a, this is a human shoulder blade, and what I brought in today is a, is a 3D printout, a cast of, of Australopithecus afarensis lucy, okay. um, which is a pretty famous fossil. This is her shoulder blade, and it's pretty um, fragmentary. You can see most of the blade is missing, but that's not uncommon in the fossil record. This is a pretty, it's a thin, very Thin bone, um, yeah. um, fragile bone. It doesn't often preserve in the fossil record. Um, the reason I brought this in is we don't have a, I don't have a cast of the Naledi scapula, but the preservation of the Naledi scapula is very similar to this. And the, the thing that's interesting about Lucy's um, scapula is that it's quite primitive. It's somewhat in between its morphology between a modern human and I brought in, this is a chimpanzee scapula. So her morphology whether the viewers so the, believe me or not. Well, yeah. we may, may not be able to see mm -hmm. this, but what would be one of the distinguishing things that would say that's a chimpanzee and this is uh, Lucy and this is a... Well, some of the things that are different are, you could see this feature is called the scapular spine okay. and it's much more angulated in, in a chimpanzee. And this feature is the glenoid fossa, which is where our, our shoulder joint okay. meets the, the upper arm. And in a chimpanzee, the, the, the joint points more cranially towards the ceiling, whereas is, is it for climbing? For more? climbing, yes. Yeah. Okay. And humans, it, our joint faces more out to the side because we manipulate more we, down here. We do we, have a range of motion because yeah. we are descended from apes, but we have kind of reconfigured the shoulder joint so that it doesn't face up, it faces more to the side. Lucy's joint faces somewhat in between a chimp and a human's. Okay. And we think that might be indicative that even though these individuals were likely walking upright, we think that climbing was still a part of this species um, locomotor and, repertoire. And you can um, carbon date or some other way determine when that's when mm -hmm. this this specimen shows up, so you can estimate when it's yeah. when it appears, so you can say it's in this in this lineage. Yeah, I guess. Lucy was found okay. in Ethiopia. The stratigraphy of the sediments is much more easily done, and we have volcanic tuff beds that are laid down at regular intervals, and we can date those directly. So we know that Lucy lived about three plus million years ago. That's not the case with Naledi as far Which as dating. Is something the creationists yeah. can't understand, that sure. you can actually date something date within yeah. a few thousand years or 10,000 years yeah. over millions of years. And you're able to make some conclusions sure. from that, right? And the interesting thing about Naledi's, which we don't know the date, but I'd say that it's likely not three million years ago, but I really can't say that for sure, and it could be proven wrong. But the morphology of her or his scapula is even more primitive, more ape-like than Lucy's. Oh, Naledi is before Lucy. Well, if you were just looking at the shoulder morphology, okay. it's more primitive. However, other parts of the skeleton are more human-like. So that's part of the interesting thing is that if we're so comparing hence it to So you have more Lucy, study. Yes, have more, for sure. Because that was one of my questions. Mm -hmm. One of the things said that you're going to continue to study the scapula. Yes. It was, yeah. I was wondering, well, how do you do that? You look <laughs> at it, you measure it. How many times are you going to do that? Maybe you could talk a little bit about the workshop that everybody okay. was... Uh, because you weren't the only one there. No. I mean, people came with all different specialties, and, yeah. and they didn't just let everybody grab a box and <laughs> go off to the side. So can you talk about uh, the, the, the workshop that mm -hmm. took place before you actually started to do the, the study and the determination? Yeah. Well, when we, when we arrived and, and the lead up to the arrival, we were, we were kind of split into our areas of expertise. So I joined a team that was studying the upper limb remains because we have uh, parts of the clavicle. We have a nearly complete humerus, uh, the arm bone. We have forearm bones, and there was a whole other team devoted to the hand bones because there were 
a, one complete hand and several other um, isolated hand bones. There was a team that was going to study the lower limb bones, and then another team that was studying the foot bones, or <laughs> articulated feet. And that doesn't even mention the, the non-postcranial like people. Sounds like the blues song. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I don't so mean to interrupt. That's We've fine. only got about a minute left. That's so fine. I so, so I, I came in, and luckily, when Lee called in junior scientists, we are the people that have recently gone out and collected comparative data. So I've gone to different museums and collected uh, measurements on humans, chimps, and other apes, and I can bring that data set. I can measure Naledi, and I can plug it right into my data set and really see where it fits in, in modern species and also other fossil species that preserve So everybody that morphology. had a different expertise. They went about the business of doing yeah. the measurements, doing the study. Mm -hmm. Then everybody comes back together and you share this information so that you we write the papers. Yeah. Write mm -hmm. the papers, determine that the bone that at least the upper body looks like it was pre-Lucy, but the other parts of the body look like it's post-Lucy yeah. and now you have to uh, uh, figure out what that means. Figure out what and that means. And without a date, it's tough, but at least morphologically, we can say that there's a lot of experimenting going on in evolution. Well, I'm glad they found 15 specimens because <laughs> it's not like, was it the Piltman? The, 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 uh, Piltdown? The, the Piltdown uh -huh. man where they, somebody found in their backyard and they basically yeah. put all this together and confused anybody. With fi but mm -hmm. with 15 specimens, you have uh, much yeah. more to go on. It, and, it's hard to. Um, to I assume Make at some hoax. point you'll be publishing on this with your colleagues and others. Well, in addition, so the, the initial announcement that came out had a few bits and pieces about, like a few sentences about the upper limb, and we currently have a, a paper, a full paper describing the upper limb, including the scapula, the clavicle, and the rest of the arm and forearm that's right. in review, and we're hoping to hear soon. Does it go all the way to the hand? There's a separate paper on the hand that just came oh, thank, out. Thank you for coming. <laughs> okay, that's all the time we have. Okay. We could probably do another whole 30 minutes at least, so maybe we'll have you back. That's all the time we have on our program. Uh, thank you, Dr. Green, for joining me on Calumet Roundtable. I'm your host, Lee Arts. Have a great day.